this statement where Krishna says in the 18th chapter that manmana bhava malbhato vadyati namasku the four things only uh, manmana that you think of me bhava malbhato you become my devotee uh, uh, vyajima worship namasku offer obeisances so these four things very simple activities chanting Hare Krishna mantra very simple Prabhupada always said even a child can do that even a dog can chant Hare Krishna and here we've heard this well known verse spoken by Mother Devakuti in which he says that someone who is chanting the holy name of the Lord must be understood to be most advanced in spiritual life even if born in family of dog years. Such chanters have undoubtedly performed all kinds of austerities and sacrifices, bathed in all sacred places and finished all scriptural studies. So, should someone be born in, a, in an uh, extremely sinful, unfortunate situation, yet become attracted to chanting the holy name of the Lord, then there is no consideration of the sinful background, the sinful karma. Because sincere chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra, chanting without offenses, this completely destroys all sins. Even if one is uh, not educated, apparently, not educated in the Vedas, How can such a bold statement be made? Because one who chants the Hare Krishna Mahamantra sincerely, avoiding offenses, with love, with devotion, with actual attachment, that means he has surpassed all preliminary study of the Vedas. He's already gone through that. Therefore, he has come to this stage. So there was a king. Uh, who, because he was in opulence, had so much facility to sense gratification. Then, in the course of enjoying all kinds of sensual pleasures, he committed many, many sins, he made many, many offenses. And as a result of that, uh, his body became black. His body was not black before, but his body became very dark as a result of excessive sins. So he was embarrassed by this. He thought that uh, now because I've become so dark, people will understand that I'm sinful. So this is not very good. They should respect me. I'm the after all. So he requested the help of his chief Brahman, chief Brahman in his court, he was a master of rituals. And he asked the Brahmana, is there anything that I can do to become relieved of all these sinful reactions? So that I will lose this black color that I'm acquired. So his Brahman said, yes, I can perform a sacrifice, very difficult to do, but 18 day sacrifice. And at the end, you can be relieved of all the sins. All right, then. Immediately, I'll give all the money in my treasury. You just arrange for the sacrifice. So the Brahmin did so. And he called in all the other Brahmins big Brahmins from the kingdom to help him to the many, many Brahmins. It was a big, fabulous arrangement for this yogya. And one condition, the reason why this yogya costs so much, is that two statues had to be formed. A statue of a man and a statue of a woman. Full-size statues. 
had to be made of solid gold. So the king had to spend his entire treasury for this. So the, this big yagya was made, and at the end of 18 days, then the uh, Raman, he took the a sacrificial spoon. You've seen in the yagyas special spoon things, or in ghee. So he took this and touched it to the body of the sinful king. And then he touched it to the two statues. And these two statues immediately became black. And the king, his black color faded away. So the king was very happy and said, oh, it was a success. And the Brahmin said, not quite. It's not quite finished yet. One more thing. What's that? Well, someone has to take these two statues in charity. You see, I've transferred all the sins, all of your sins to these two statues. But someone has to take, accept them in charity. <coughs> then by doing that, all of your sins will come upon them. And then you won't have any more problems. Unless they, <coughs> statues are taken by someone, then the sins will come back to you. Oh, then who will take? So then this chief Brahmin, he turned to all the other Brahmins and announced, uh, you have helped me in this sacrifice, so here is your reward. Anyone who wants these two gold statues, remember they were gold, not in life, but <coughs> you just take. But these Brahmins, they were all intelligent. They understand what had been going on. So they immediately got up and left. <laughs> Nothing doing. We're not having anything to do with this. Left. So, but it just so happened at this time that a foreign brother arrived in the town, in the capital city of this king. He was not only a foreigner, but he was also very uneducated. He didn't know anything about mantra, tantra, yantra, political skills, yoga, he didn't know. He was not learned in Sanskrit at all. He was practically speaking completely. So this Brahma just happened to come to the palace because he would go into to kings and to wealthy people. Big honors on that. So he just happened to come in. And this chief Brahman, he was very clever, so he could immediately understand seeing this Brahman walk in. He could immediately understand just from science. He's a fool. <laughs> so uh, the chief Brahman, he greeted this new Brahman with great flattery. Oh, learned pundit from foreign country. Surely you have come here seeking the king's benediction, seeking uh, donation. Yes, actually, that is why I've come. But you've come just at the right time. We've just finished a big 18-day sacrifice. And we have here two extremely valuable statues, although they look black. They're actually solid gold. So, you take them both. Oh, I've never, ever been given so much wealth. Just see full-size statues too. One man, one woman. Solid gold just for me. Oh, right. So he approached the two statues and he touched them. And as soon as he touched them, then out of the two statues came two horrible entities. They look like devils <coughs> with scattered long hair and horrible ugly faces and staring eyes and broken teeth in the mouth <laughs> and skinny skeleton-like arms and legs and covered in 
filthy clothes and their bodies were cut and bleeding. So it was a, such a male creature, such a female creature. The bloodshot, staring eyes. And they came up. <laughs> These were the sins of that king in person. And these two creatures uh, set off after the Brahmin in hot pursuit. He, he was so frightened, he began to run and they came right after him. They were laughing and giggling and screaming. And so he went running off down the street through the town and beyond the city walls and into the country. So the king was very astonished expect this. So he wanted to see what's going to happen. So he jumped on his fastest horse and he went riding after his run and the two ghostly creatures. And uh, after not too long, he came to a kund, a lake outside of the town. And there he saw, just as he was coming up, the Brahman was rushing into the lake. And he ran in until he was waist deep and then he turned and faced the two ghosts. These two ghostly creatures were just coming to the edge of the lake, just ready to enter. And suddenly he began to chant something. The king, the king was too far away still to hear what he was saying, but he could see he's chanting something. And by chanting this mantra, then Vishnu Dutas appeared. The Vishnu Dutas uh, ringed around the Brahman. And when the ghostly creatures tried to approach the Brahman, they were destroyed. They were burned <coughs> into ashes. Nothing was left. So the king was amazed. He saw that the Brahman stopped chanting and the Vishnu Dutas disappeared. So as the Brahman came out of the water, the king very humbly said, My dear Brahman, what was that mantra you were chanting? The Brahman said, Actually, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You, you were chanting mantra such a wonderful effect. You must be highly learned, highly realized, pure devotee. The Brahman said, actually, I'm a fool, I'm ignorant. I don't know how to read and write. My whole life I was foolish. My father gave up on me, kicked me out. He tried to teach me the Vedas. I couldn't learn anything. But, as I was traveling here and there, I met one great Vaishnava sannyasi who took compassion upon me. And he said, you are a Brahman. So you must know something. And I said, well, I don't know anything. I'm sorry, I'm too foolish. And so the sannyasi said, well, I will teach you the essence of knowledge. That you can learn. Two lines from Bhagavad Gita. So he taught this Brahman, this manmana abhavamadva pantyaji manmana It's not even a whole verse. It's half of a verse. And very faithfully, because the Brahman had much, so much faith in this Vaishnava Sannyasi. So very faithfully, the Brahman put these two lines from 18th chapter, take 65, into his heart. And he had so much faith in the instructions given to him by this Sannyasi. Firmly believed everything. And the Sannyasi had told him, whenever there's danger, if there's any problem, you chant this. And indeed you cannot stay. So this king was amazed. And he has chanted just these two lines from one verse of Bhagavad Gita. But with complete faith and devotion. And this completely burned up all of my sins which had entered into those two statues. So then the king, his his uh, chief brother then arrived at the spot and saw the king throwing down his helmet and taking off 
always opulent clothing and putting on very simple clothes. And then Brahma said, Your Majesty, what are you doing? And the king replied, I am giving up this king. I am going off to the forest to seek out great sages. Why? How can you do such a thing? You're the king, you're responsible. No, no, I have just seen a miracle today. How chanting one half of a verse of Bhagavad Gita can destroy all sins. So just think, what will be the result if I can learn the whole Bhagavad Gita seven hundred verses? So I am renouncing everything for that purpose. So this is a nice story which illustrates how one who becomes attached to the essence. Bhagavad Gita is the essence. Sri Parshankaracharya has uh, written, this is quoted by Shri Prabhupada in the introduction, right? in his Gita Dhyana. And then uh, Lord Krishna has milked, he's taken the milk from the herd of the Upanishads, he's compared the Upanishads to cows, 108 cows. And Krishna is Gopal, cow and boy. So the Upanishads contain all the uh, profound philosophical knowledge of the Vedas. They're very difficult to understand these Upanishads. It, this is actually Vedanta. Upanishad means Vedanta philosophy. But Lord Krishna has milked all these Upanishads. And this milk in one bucket is Bhagavad Gita. So we need only drink from this milk that Krishna is serving. And similarly, we need only chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Because Iti Shodash Kam Nam Nam, in that holy name, 16 syllables, Sarvadesha Vishuddhi. All Vedic wisdom, all Vedic power is compressed therein. Iti Shodash Kam Nam Nam Kali. Kali Kalvasha Nasha. And by chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Kali Kalvasha Nasha. All the sinful influence of the Kali Yuga, national, is destroyed, burned out. Just like those two ghostly creatures. So, therefore we should become attached to chanting like this. This is the success in life. We should mold our lives in such a way that we become attached. Now, actually one can only become attached to the Hare Krishna Mantra by the grace of the Hare Krishna Mantra because uh, the name and the Lord are the same. So this is the benediction of the Lord when the devotee becomes attached to chanting Hare Krishna. Therefore we have to serve the Lord. To become attached, to receive that mercy of attachment, we have to serve the Lord. Now one way to serve the Holy Name is to chant like Hari Das Thakur, 300,000 names a day. If you can do that, very good. Please, if anyone here is doing that already now, chanting 196 rounds a day, go on. That's perfect. But if you find that 196 rounds a day is a little too much, <laughs> then by Shiva Prabhupada's grace, there are so many other ways. Actually, this whole ISKCON movement is designed in such a way that we can stay always in service to the Holy Name of the Lord and by serving the Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan Mishra. So many varieties of ways according to our nature, our mentality, our talents, our propensities. Just become engaged in this serving, Nam Bhajra, serving the Holy Name. And by Krishna's grace, we become attached. And we see, we before just had a kirtan for one hour, chanting, as Prabhupada introduced, he called this the Stay High Forever Kirtan. This was a short one, <laughs> one hour. Sometimes we go more than two hours. 
But we could, everyone here could feel the ecstasy, the prolonged association with the holy name of the Lord. So we should all be praying for the benediction that this ecstasy that we just tasted during this one hour period. That it may increase and increase and pervade our entire, our entire day. Why just one hour a day? Or in the morning also one, two hours we chant. <coughs> but actually our whole 24 hours a day should be pervaded with the ecstasy of association with Krishna through His holy name. So that should be our prayer. And to have our prayer answered, we should be constantly serving the holy name. So, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, I have one question which I, I would like to write in two small parts. And the first correspondence is that what is the difference between the mantras and the voices? And the second, when you take it in a regard of, it's okay, for example, ordinary being, mortal being, you know, if you get it someplace, it's good for people. But uh, uh, sometimes when I read in the books, when his father, Shabbat, uh, used to invite the others, and the masses of gurus, that was also uh, asking for a blessing that his son can be. This is like one. Second is, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, since he got uh, initiated and he returned back to the, his village, he used to, that time he used to help the Brahmanas to get out from the water, collecting all these clothes, and he also was asking for the blessing. And he gave this famous blessing that he did. All my mothers make it into Vaishnavas. And the third is, when uh, he's a Kalabra, uh, then uh, Dhanacharya, the Tuski, the Tuski, he started worshipping and then uh, he got the knowledge. And then, and then Arjuna saw this when uh, they came to him. And Arjuna asked how it happened that he become like that. And then uh, I saw him, uh, I can say that he spoke about that. Uh, he returned to him and said that uh, actually he still my knowledge. Dhanacharya said he still my knowledge. And I'm a little bit confused. Who have tried to claim that he's my knowledge or uh, how I can worship my guru if he uh, don't like me, how I can get his knowledge or what is actually all together, what is the blessings. Or if I work in car and now I have a somebody, how I can accept, okay, now you give blessing to me because actually I deserve the blessings. I think it's uh, like a one way to make you humble. Well, it is a natural aspect of culture to seek blessings of persons who are dear to Krishna, Brahmanas are dear to Krishna, Vaishnava Brahmanas, all the devotees are dear to Krishna. So in Adi Purana, Lord Krishna says that one who claims to be my, uh, be my devotee is not my devotee, but one who is a devotee of my devotee, he is my devotee. So to get Krishna's favor, we should, Prabhupada used to say, should please Krishna's dog. So the devotees of the Lord, they are the dogs or the servants of Krishna. So it was a natural thing. The Lord Chaitanya came as since you mentioned him as example. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's Krishna, but he came as Krishna's devotee, Krishna's best devotee. Who can be a better devotee than Lord Chaitanya? Because he's Krishna himself. So he set the best example. And we see how he is always trying to get the blessings of the Vaishnavas. So we should certainly do the same. We should certainly not offend the devotees but rather serve them so that they will be pleased with us. If the devotees are pleased with us, then Krishna will be pleased with us. It's very simple for me. Now as far as your second 
point about a Kalavya. The spiritual master, uh, he has to uh, judge those who come to him seeking instruction, seeking initiation. He has to see that they're actually qualified. <coughs> so there's a period of testing. Uh, so you see Krishna consciousness begins with faith. Anausha. So there's an exchange of faith in the beginning. This disciple has faith in the spiritual master and the spiritual master has faith in the disciple. The spiritual master thinks that this person for whatever reason he'll not be able to, to receive what I am teaching properly then you should not accept that person as disciple, you should not give him initiation. And so it was with Ekalavya. Ekalavya was from the uh, class of uh, Aboriginal people in the forest. And uh, these people are very uh, savage, very cruel hunters. Nikolavi was a hunter, so he was cruel, he was savage. He was coming, you see it was a different case. We have also the case of Murray, the hunter, and Narada Muni. But that's a different case. Because Murray, the hunter, was attracted to Narada Muni because of Narada Muni's exalted spiritual status. He became attracted, he could see that, oh, he is very pure. And he wanted to do some service, not thinking of anything in return. But Ekalavi approached Dronacharya uh, for military knowledge, not spiritual knowledge. He wanted uh, the downward day knowledge. So he was approaching us in a very devoted way. But he had this motivation and Dronacharya could understand. If I teach him the big science, downward day, if I give him mantras, uh, these uh, astras, weapons that are called weapons of the demigods that are called by mantras. Then there's no telling what this person will do once he attains these powers. So therefore he refused him. No. I'll not accept him. So this Ekalavya was so <coughs> lusty to, to get this knowledge that he, after the uh, jungle religion of these Aboriginal people, he fashioned a kind of murti of Dronacharya and did some kind of special worship as they do. They know how to do these things. And so in this way, Dronacharya's knowledge manifested in Ekala. The fact that Dronacharya considered that Ekalavya had stolen knowledge from him. And therefore, he said, so you have received my knowledge, but you didn't give dakshin. You have taken me as guru, but you have not paid guru dakshin. <coughs> so, so then Ekalavya said, yes, please. What do you want from me? I will get you. Yes, I request that you give me your right thumb. That will be my function. Cut off his right thumb, he had a And this way, then it was certain that he could not surpass Arjuna <coughs> and the skill of homage. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati cites this example as. as uh, insincerity. If Ekalavya was actually devoted to Dronacharya, then he would have accepted whatever he said. But because he had a hidden motive, therefore when he was rejected and sent away, he could not accept that. And so he went by some other process to steal his knowledge. Whereas, you know, from the story of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati himself, 
and Gorka Shorda's Babaji. Gorka Shorda's Babaji sent him away. He approached initiation on the order of his spiritual father, his uh, father, Bhakti Nam Thakur, but Gorka Shorda's Babaji avoided him. And so finally, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said simply that I have been told by my father to accept you as my spiritual master. If you do not, then there is no use to my life. Then I will throw myself from a bridge and drown you. Now this means no other motive. Either I can become your disciple and serve you, or I can't live. Whereas Ekalavya, he calculated, huh? He won't accept me as a disciple, but there's another way I can get what I want. So, his hidden motive, selfish motive, was exposed. Some people, they... <laughs> it is actually not an uncommon thing that there are people who take Ekalavya as some kind of good example, very devoted person, dedicated person, but no, actually. All right. Excuse me, I yes. will be saying a lot of a story. In our schools and things in the lower classes, we say a lot of the group was something to the so we were very much uh, discussed. And we were taught that not by spiritual teachers, but the school teachers, with the kind of symptoms. And a kind of uh, selfish pride or high attitude from the privileged to the academic classes. <coughs> I can understand that was the problem. And uh, I think if you allow me, I would hope that uh, it was a bad time of the other the Kalapad was by his own way, he had he achieved some knowledge without cooperation or activity of the Macharya. So that karma was reflected in the Guru's head by that man Arjuna's favor, and he was killed by Arjuna. I don't think it will be accepted, but I see it. You're welcome to. Any other? There's another question. Yes. I just, I just wonder how this not ignorance can go together with Bra Brahma. Brahma can be ignorant. Brahma? Brahma can be ignorant. You're speaking of Lord Brahma? Or? No, it was in this uh, story that Brahma <coughs> was quite ignorant. Brahma? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that meant. That means that he was uneducated. Doesn't mean he was in the mode of ignorance. Just that he was uneducated. He was somehow not able to learn all the technical rituals that Brahmins normally learn. But the point is, we heard in the purport, Srila Prabhupada write that advanced transcendentalists were advanced from previous birth, but generally not attracted to learn these rituals. So he was not attracted to the rituals, to the karma, uh, kandiya portions that his father wanted to teach him. But when he got to the association of Vaishnava Guru and learned just this half verse of Bhagavad Gita, and then he took that verse to heart. So that means he took Krishna the lotus feet to heart. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Jnana, Jnaya, Jnana Gamyam. I am knowledge, I am the object of knowledge, I am the source of knowledge. So one who becomes attached to Krishna, and chanting Krishna's name, and remembers Krishna, one mana bhagavad bhaktavi, when he follows this very verse that the Brahman learned, then uh, he is situated on the highest 
Lord Krishna declares, Tesham Nivana Kam Partam Aham Jnana Jum Tamaha. And to show my devotees and mercy, I destroy the ignorance, whatever ignorance they may have in their heart. Jnana Dipena Babasto. I become the shining torchlight of knowledge. So, Srila Prabhupada always used to cite that verse. If someone would try to say, well, devotees, sometimes we see they're not very learned, they're not very skilled in uh, letters, in knowledge, in philosophy. And Srila Prabhupada would say to this person, no, if they are Krishna conscious, if they know Krishna, then Tesha Maivan will come apart them. And they are not ignorant. Someone may be simple, that's another thing. Someone may be very simple, not so skillful in mental speculation. But that doesn't mean that they're ignorant. That's just a certain frame of mind. You see, but uh, uh, on the other side, uh, some intellectual may be very, very skillful in juggling words and making tricky uh, remarks, tricky arguments. He may be very, very skillful in that, but if he's not Krishna conscious, if he's not attracted to Krishna, in fact, if, he, if his knowledge is used to somehow or other uh, oppose Krishna consciousness, to oppose the conclusions of Bhagavad Gita, then that man is actually the greatest fool. He's fooling himself. His and that's just what Sanatana Goswami declared when he came before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, here you actually see the, the painting right there. This is Sanatana Goswami. He came dressed as a Darvesh, a Muslim mendicant, because that was the only way he could get free of Noah Hussein Shah in Bengal. So he escaped, dressed himself as Darvesh, and told the Muslim uh, guards, one Muslim guard he bribed, that I'm going to Mecca. I'm going to Mecca, surrender myself to Allah. <laughs> so then the guards said, all right, you can go. So therefore he came <coughs> to Mahaprabhu uh, in Prayar, in this dress. <coughs> and as he presented himself to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he declared that people say I'm a pundit. People say that I am very learned. Because Sanatana Goswami, uh, being a minister of the Noah, so he was skilled in Sanskrit, he was a master of Sanskrit knowledge, but he also spoke the Persian language, which in those days, uh, 500 years ago in India, Persian that was the language of the ruling class in North India because Muslims had conquered Northern India. So the court language was uh, Persian, Farsi. So he was uh, a master in the Persian language. The modern language Hindi is a kind of mishmash between uh, Prakrit, Sanskrit, and, and Persian. Anyway, so. Uh, yeah, Persian, Arabian also, and other languages. He's very, very learned. So he said, people say that I am learned. And I am such a fool that I believe. This was his declaration. Everybody praises me as a learned man, but I am such a fool that I believe. And then he asked, then he said, he asked the actual important questions. Kayami, uh, which means, who am I? And why am I suffering? The tapatraya, threefold miseries. How do I get out of this? These three questions are actually the beginning of real knowledge. 
So one may be very learned. He may know so many languages and uh, logical uh, arguments. He may be so skilled in rhetoric. Rhetoric means skilled in, in talking. But if he doesn't know Kayan, if he doesn't know who he is, if he doesn't know that he's suffering the three whole miseries, that his, his body is giving him trouble, his mind is giving him trouble. People could proclaim me to be a pundit, a wise man. And I'm so foolish, I believe. But I don't know the answer to these three questions. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm suffering, I don't know how to be out of suffering. But I am fool number one. And that's, in that way, he surrendered himself as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's disciple. So, simplicity is not ignorance. <coughs> ignorance means to not know the answer to these three questions. And yet you think, oh, I'm a very intelligent person. That's it. Okay. Yes? Um, it's, it is said that when one gives spiritual instructions, uh, at the same time there is given also strength to, to execute them, to, to one who listens to accept them. Um, um, is it like when we are, for example, listening classes of uh, devotees who are exactly our spiritual master, like, uh, um, is it the same when you just accept these instructions? Uh, there is also given power uh, to execute them with personal faith or um, Well, there is power in knowledge. Huh? Knowledge means that which defeats ignorance. And it's ignorance that makes us weak. Ignorance means <laughs> that I think I'm my body, I think I'm my mind. And immediately we're in a very dangerous weak condition for that conception. Immediately we are playthings in the hands of mind. So real strength, you see, like Prabhupada says, and there is only one hero in this world. There's so many people who are famous as heroes, as brave men, great fighters, great conquerors. But Prabhupada said, there is only one hero in this world. And that is the person who has controlled his senses, conquered his senses. That person is a hero. Everyone else, someone may be a Napoleon or whatever, conquered the world. But, like it is stated in, by Lord Kapiladev, that these uh, uh, the Kalbubi Chumbaina Kailan <coughs> anyway, I don't remember that but uh, the verse is, the translation is that uh, it's coming to my mind Balame Pashinya Maya Stream Maya Jai Mokishan So he says that just see the mighty strength of my Maya. That someone may be a world conqueror. He may be such a great general or king who conquered many, many lands and many, many people. And everyone thinks he's a hero. But as soon as a beautiful woman moves her eyebrow, he is defeated. <laughs> so he's not actually a hero. He's under the com complete control of mind. Because of ignorance, because of identifying with the body, with the mind, Maya can immediately catch him. So ignorance makes us weak, and on the other side, knowledge makes us strong. Because knowledge uh, cuts through Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita he refers to knowledge as a weapon to which we cut this attachment. So you receive this weapon of knowledge from those who give knowledge. So 
the initiating spiritual master, Diksha Guru, he is naturally the Shiksha Guru. He's naturally giving instruction. But uh, others also are able to give the weapon of knowledge that also helps to cut through the knot of attachment. Prabhupada said that's the meaning of the uh, word sadhu. Sadhu means he whose words cut through our ignorance. So, sadhu sangha, Prabhupada often said this is why he had created this Iskar movement, this Hare Krishna movement, just so that we could have sadhu sangha get association with sadhus. We should be very eager to hear from sadhus, hear their sharp words, <laughs> cut away our ignorance, cut through our attachment. And by hearing these words, we get knowledge and power. Yeah, I'm you mentioned this and when you're initiated, you should go around and beg. <laughs> and wherever you beg, you give to your spiritual master. This is the Vedic tradition. It is a duty. That's all. How much what? How much attention we should pay to learn in Krishnapas? Chanaka Pandit says that every day you should learn one shloka. And if you can't learn one shloka, then you should learn half a shloka. If you can't learn half a shloka every day, then at least every day you should learn one word in <coughs> shloka. Srila Prabhupada 